Good morning and uh, welcome to Where is the Trade for Thursday, September 10th, 2020. Patrick Serezna here. This morning, uh, the market uh, is uh, just edging higher. Uh, so we can see here that um, the S&P 500 uh, reversal candle yesterday, starting with a little bit of green. Uh, one of the things I was showing on this morning's Where's the Trade is this uh, uh, flagging formation, which just in the last uh, couple hours has very clearly uh, uh, um, is breaking the flagging formation to the upside. And so the narrative uh, that uh, we continue to, uh, to watch for at this stage is that if this impulse is going higher, then uh, the, it measures out on a one hour chart for completion towards this, uh, this zone up here, uh, which lies around, let's call it the 3450 to 3500 uh, zone on the S&P. And you can observe that the 61.8 retracement zone that we typically target also lies around this uh, 3450 to 3480 area right in here. And so this becomes uh, the high interest zone because, um, uh, so because uh, if we get up there, then that actually is a very asymmetric moment to hammer the market short a second time ar around. And so, uh, so, this is, uh, so this is where we're going to be watching. Now, uh, whichever way, w uh, whether it rejects here, whether it rejects here, these are starting to be very asymmetric levels. And what do I mean by that is, is that if we're wrong on a short, uh, a, a new short, because we have our straddles, our straddles are positioned that the trade is the trade. But let's say you are going in here and you're starting to hammer brand new short cells uh, into this zone right over here. Uh, so for let's just round it off to, uh, let's round it off to being a, um, let's say a 50 S&P point stop. But at the same time, a, a move to the downside from this level uh, would offer, I'm just gonna use the, let's just say you executed at 3440. I'm just, that's our hypothetical level. And you put in a 50 point stop, but your profit potential is down here. You can observe you're talking about a 50 point risk for a 270 point potential gain. Actually, I used the wrong one there. That's the opposite. I have to use the short one, not the long. There we go. 50 point stop to a potential 200 and, you know, 70 point gain. The point being here, it's asymmetric. That's what we always seek uh, in, uh, in our entire trading thing. It's not, we can never guarantee a trade will work. Uh, only thing we can look for is the periods in the market where we can take a small risk and have the potential for extraordinary gains. To me, this, is, uh, this continues to be a very interesting level uh, where if the market offers it to us, it would, uh, we would be foolish not to at least take it uh, uh, on, on, an, uh, on a stab. So that is 100% what I'm looking for to see where this the potentially could fail. It could fail here, but long as, long as you're giving this a little bit of breathing room, that's, uh, that's what we're looking at from that perspective. So the uh, crude oil, will we already see a bounce. I'm gonna go down to a one hour chart on crude. And in a similar manner to what we're seeing on the S&P 500, after crude oil had impulse lower, we're more than likely zigzagging crude to the upside. And we might see crude here impulse to $39, $40 on the upside, just as an, a, a, a typical reaction from an incredibly oversold state. But if we see, I'm gonna to go to a four hour chart. If all we see is crude oil essentially zigzag its way up to like $40, and that's the most it can muster up, then another impulse lower as well would be the path of least resistance for, for crude oil. I personally think crude oil will be a buy on dip on anything, I you've already heard me say it. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll um, uh, watch and see how that plays out. Evan, uh, what's driving the dollar smash is, uh, is the Euro um, and particularly the ECB announcement. Uh, they really did nothing, but the Euro started moving the moment the um, announcement and uh, 
uh, started uh, to come out. So we'll see uh, what happens. I personally, what I have found uh, is, is that the first impulse of the one, two hours after a central bank announcement tends to be faded the next 24 hours afterwards. So before I, before I uh, make any assumptions about the dollar, I, I want to see uh, what, uh, what really happens here by the end of the day and into tomorrow, right? But obviously, a little bit of a downturn. What would be uh, really interesting, if you go to the Dixie this way, in order to solidify sort of an inverted head and shoulders pattern, what would be particularly interesting is if the dollar index found support down here around this 92.50 level, and, uh, and it ended up being sort of an inverted head and shoulders pattern that developed. And the only way to find that out is to see whether or not the bulls react uh, off of these levels. And so that's something that we're going to keep a close eye on. When doing the NASDAQ, which uh, uh, Rupert, you're talking about the cues, but the, the 24 hour charts of the NASDAQ are, are, are a better place to do the analysis. But you can, um, the observation here is that that flagging formation that you're seeing here that developed on uh, this it's the same one that's on the s&p it's just this is the nasdaq version of it that would mean that this breakout is measuring up to about uh, 11,800 or so which you can see conveniently is the these previous highs of this little move and that's also where the nasdaq uh, fib zones are so the if we you had the nasdaq impulse here another um, 300 points that becomes the level on the NASDAQ for, for this. It, and that we should see the S&P hitting its target zones the same time as the NASDAQ does that, right? And so that would be what you're looking for there, Rupert. Anyway, so, uh, so the market sold hard. We're getting the reaction. This is, this is not anything abnormal other than it sucks to see the P&L that you had on your trade being uh, uh, washed away on the reaction and that's always the difficult part of holding positions over a longer term move is that yeah, all of these little intraday and multi-day swings cause that volatility, which makes you second guess everything. But I, I think we have a plan and I'm sticking with it. Uh, it I think everything's fine. So the, the second thing that I want to talk about, though, is, is gold and silver. And will gold and silver break out to the upside? Now, for silver, uh, one would see an ascending triangle, uh, which is essentially the entire pullback here was just a fib retrace. Uh, and more or less, you have uh, the top end of this range. And the question is, does this ascending triangle break out on silver to the upside, which uh, rockets uh, silver up towards 35, 36? The, the, this is a... a a strong enough possibility that we went back to our income writing on SLV uh, just because it, we were thinking that there could be a break. And at this moment, there's no sign of any selling pressure coming in on gold and silver. And so for me, I think it's, um, uh, it's worth watching how this plays out. You can see gold, it's just been coiling up in this, um, in this uh, triangle formation. And we're going to uh, observe whether or not it uh, bullishly resolves itself uh, with, uh, with an advance up, uh, which would send gold to 2200 to 2280 if the triangle broke out to the upside, and this being the midpoint consolidation. And so that is what we are going to continue to, to watch very closely on, on, uh, on gold and silver. So the, the other big story is how did gold miners open this morning? They're trying to break out. There is, there is no denying that, um, that there's a breakout attempt. The question is, will it prairie dog or is it going to be for reals? And, uh, and what's interesting is I do remember uh, um, it didn't happen in the last cycle, but I do remember on numerous occasions in the past where the gold miners preemptively front run the, uh, the actual move in the commodity. And as an example, um, let's see, use energy stocks. Energy stocks have been selling for over a month, but oil only broke last week. Uh, sometimes what happens is that the, the traders or, already can read between the lines 
and they front run the equity before the commodity really gets things underway. And so the question, are gold miners kind of signaling that, uh, that the breakout will be to the upside on gold and silver uh, commodities? Interesting. I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's, um, I don't want to say that I know that that will happen, but let's pay attention. I think that this is a, it's interesting the way that this is developing uh, uh, as we're going. And um, uh, Paul, uh, Paul, you're asking, uh, can you review the relationship between equities, commodities, US dollars, bonds in the risk off phase? Uh, there's an entire segment in the, the macro master's course that you're part of that talks about that. And we'll talk about that as in more detail in that macro master's tutorial, but that's all in there, Paul. Uh, the, and the, anyway, the, the point though here is, is will we see gold break out? That's one of the really interesting things that, uh, that we're gonna watch and see to see whether that plays out. Very quickly also, Ted, the gamma flip level on the S&P is all along this 3,300 mark. Uh, it's interesting, actually we temporarily broke, it was like 20, it was like around 3,320 or so. The point is, is that the on balance dealers become net sellers on the indexes with legitimate breakdowns below there on the gamma flip level. So this is why, uh, if this rally that we're seeing this morning ultimately fails over the next like three, two, three trading sessions and rolls over, um, all of the CTA sell triggers are down here. All of, uh, if vol spikes, then the average volatility, which uh, uh, for vol targeting funds will force them to delever. You're going to have a whole wave of index selling. All the technicians are going to begin selling because you're going to have uh, technical crossovers. You're going to have all sorts of sell signals that come in. It would be a floodgate opening if we started breaking below 3,300. Uh, there's no way that, uh, like, I, I would be shocked if, let's say, we had a break below 3,300 and it just stopped at 3,250 and, and that was it. Uh, if we're under 3,300, I don't know how it doesn't tack on an extra two or 300 S&P points, the downside as a, a, as a very heavy sell cycle would be engaged in that way. I think it would feel very much like when the, uh, this first impulse lower, not the whole coronavirus crash, but those five days that happened that, that once that 50 day moving average broke over there, that kind of a sell cycle would be what I would feel would be in order if that 3,300 was given out on the downside. And that's, um, and that's uh, what we're gonna keep watching. Um, and so, uh, yeah, absolutely, Michael. That's, uh, there's a huge amount of open interest at that 3,300 strike as well. That's gonna be really interesting to see uh, whether, uh, whether that sell cycle really engages below there or not. It all comes with whether or not, we're, we have a very oversold market, and we're getting a very typical reaction to the upside. Will the sellers hammer the rally? Is it going to be sell the rips kind of price action? What's interesting about that is when we move to the um, FANG stocks that have been leading the way, let's talk Tesla. You're also seeing a similar style bounce in Tesla. So Tesla, uh, let's break it to a one hour chart. Uh, gaps higher here after the breakdown. Uh, so what we had essentially was uh, this Tesla breakdown. You had the little short-term snap, and then you had a, a, a slightly shorter measured move finish off on the downside, and now we're getting the reaction. And so similar to uh, the, the NASDAQ or anything else, uh, you're, you're looking for these types of stocks to potentially – make it back to the FIB zones. And so notice uh, this was where this uh, short-term high came in right here, this consolidation point, this kind of 400 to 420. If this market is destined to go for another round of selling, I would imagine that Tesla will uh, kind of lead the way and that will result in a, a failure of Tesla to beat the 400 handle with any meaningful uh, volume and size and, and price. And so we'll, we'll see what happens as Tesla attempts uh, a rally toward this 400 mark. Uh, any failed rally there would almost certainly uh, open the window for Tesla to hammer to the downside toward 300 or 280. Now, the question that uh, I have in the back of my mind, are we due for 
uh, a deja vu of February, where after Tesla did its blow off to the down uh, and it went from 200 bucks all the way down to 140, right? In three days, Tesla wipes out uh, on the downside 30%, right? And then it goes for a double top retest on the upside. I mean, uh, do we have a scenario where Tesla musters up uh, a full key top retest on the upside? Boy, that's an interesting thing if we saw it. I, I'm right now, my base case remains that, it, that we should not see Tesla make much more progress than 400 to 420. Uh, but the narrative of the S&P, like, I mean, if we started seeing that price action, that Tesla is going to beat that and go for a double top retest, then we might see the NASDAQ double top retest. We might see the S&P double top retest. All of this fib retracement stuff that we're talking about, would it, all of that stuff would be thrown out the window because and it would be a different unfolding reality for us if, if we saw that kind of a move. Similarly, Apple... Uh, is uh, getting a bit of a reaction. But again, it's nothing that impressive. I mean, it tried to gap higher this morning, but, so, uh, but even here, a very short-term Apple zigzag would finish off at about 122 to 124 bucks. The, uh, a Fibonacci retrace of Apple uh, sends the stock up towards the $125 range, right where this uh, consolidation point all lies in there. You can see that over the very short term, over the very short term, all of these suggest that there, uh, the remainder of the day could still have more upside. So if you're a very short term swing trader and you're day trading throughout this morning's uh, and this afternoon session, there's no denying that all of these can day trade higher uh, an impulse higher on a one day basis. Uh, but I think that what, uh, but what will be really interesting is will we see all of these rallies get squashed uh, the moment that we have um, uh, that, that impulse higher on all of these. And that's something that we're going to watch incredibly closely as we go forward. So anyway, let's put on some trades. So in options for income, uh, I wanted, uh, I, I said that I wanted to sell an income premium on an energy stock. And um, I was very close to going back to Exxon Mobil, but then I saw that big break on uh, Suncor, which basically had disappointing guidance. And the stock, this is the Canadian, no, this is the New York Stock Exchange Suncor. Uh, and the stock broke uh, basically $2 uh, on this, on, on the downside. This is uh, basically Canada's largest energy company uh, owning uh, the vast, it's fully integrated. Uh, it's the Exxon Mobil of Canada, essentially. And the, with this break, yeah, the short-term measured move on the downside of, of, uh, of Suncor suggests that it could even uh, mosey on down towards $12. And the, but the way I look at it is that I, I do not believe Suncor is making a lower low. This is what we would uh, reference as a key bottom retest to establish the basing formation from the end of the bear market, which I continue to believe that the bear market ended in that, uh, that March, uh, April, May sell-off that we saw that basically destroyed these stocks. And so I think that um, a... Um, uh, a the, uh, uh, the fact that this stock is heading back down here, there's an opportunity for us to snag a little income premium. And so one of the things that I, I wanted to focus on here was uh, selling down along its previous low on the simple premise that uh, I do not believe that Suncor uh, will uh, make new lows. And even if it did, being stuck buying at $10 is going to prove to be an opportune price level. So what we were talking about and what we published was the selling of a long dated put at the $10 strike. Now I put $1.10, but it, the market here is a buck 35. And so I might just adjust that for the prevailing price that we're actually going to track it at. But now think of it this way. If I was, if I had, uh, Suncor put to me 
at, uh, at $10 and I made a buck 35 income, that means my average cost base or my break even is $8.65 on Suncor. And the way I look at it is if my average cost base a year from now is owning a Suncor at eight sixty five, I'll take it all day long. And if it doesn't, and I snagged myself close to a 10% premium for just over a year waiting period, I also think that that's a, a very nice income return to be making on a very solid energy company. And so uh, to me, this is a no brainer. I'm going to, I'm going to harvesting this. So it's at 14 bucks. We were talking about this January, 2022. And I want to remind everyone, uh, a lot of people uh, get hung up on the length of the, uh, of the option. But recognize that let's say three months from now, if Suncor is trading at 18 bucks again, the, uh, and volatility contracts, this $1.35 option might be trading for 40 cents or 30 cents. And you'll be able to walk away with a dollar profit in three months. And so, uh, so this idea that um, uh, uh, the getting hung up on this idea that the, you have to hold it till it's maturity is nonsense. Now, we're only going to hold it to maturity if we're going to uh, actually undertake the obligation to buy it. And, uh, and that's always a possibility, but that's not necessarily the base case of the way that things play out in our income strategy. Anyway, so here I'm just gonna demonstrate this by selling 10 of these put options uh, to the, um, uh, the $1.35 bid, uh, snag ourselves uh, 1,300 plus dollars in income premium, and uh and it's done now if you wanted to look at this for our canadian members to do this in canadian dollars which is also a very acceptable way to implement this trade um we're at 1865 the previous low on uh, the canadian market just showing the canadian dollar chart on suncor uh was around 14 bucks and so if we're turning around and we're looking at a Canadian options chain here uh, on the Canadian Suncor, let, uh, and you could even go to uh, January 2023 if you wanted to. I'm not saying we do that. But uh, a $14 strike is uh, snagging you two bucks. You can uh, pick up on the Canadian uh, $14 strike. So that would be where you would be going along the previous low there for our Canadian members. Um, and so that's, um, uh, so that uh, is where we're going. Now, those of you that have anxiety about the fact that the next three months can be a complete shit show, uh, it does not hurt to add a tactical hedge, particularly if you're taking this trade on in size. Uh, uh, um, and so, yeah, it's published right here, everyone. It's, it's the, uh, we're going to the January $10 strike right here. If those looking for that, it's published in the options for income segment of the site for those that need the details. The, uh, what I was just going to point out, if you absolutely needed to sleep at night, even if you turned around and said, I'm going to buy a December $9 put. Remember, our average cost base, if the stock is put to us, is $8.65, right? And so I could turn around and buy for the next three months a $9 put for $0.25. Cents. Now, you're forfeiting a chunk of your income, right? You're forfeiting, uh, uh, well, in this case, if you sold here at a buck forty-five and you pay $0.25, cents, you, you're walking away with, you know, buck 10, buck 20 net, but at least you know that if a shit hits the fan for the next couple months or into the elections, hey, you could turn around and um, uh, you could turn around and uh, know that you put a floor underneath your risk and, uh, and uh, have maybe a potential way to have a nice gamma hedge that might be able to repair your position if the market started to go against you in some big way. Anyway, so uh, to me, uh, that's a, a no brainer. We did that. I still, by the way, also like this uh, on Holly Frontier. Holly Frontier has uh, been going against us on the short term. It's all the way down to 21 bucks. But right now you can snag down along the previous low at 18. You can actually now pick up a buck 55. 
I personally think it's a no brainer. And in fact, you can even go lower at this stage. Those of you not in the trade, you can to pick up the same dollar that I published at, you could turn around and go to, uh, onto Holly Frontier and snag a, uh, you can go down, actually, sorry, we're to the 2021. So you could, you could turn around and even snag 70 cents uh, at $15, which I think is, uh, is just as uh, reasonable of a proposition and give yourself more downside protection along the way. Anyway, I like it. And, uh, and anyone who's still interested in putting it on can do so. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to come back in and, and uh, continue our income harvesting operation on silver. Um, and, uh, and so one thing, though, that I want to do is roll up and out the hedge. So we had that October 20 that we've been anchored off of. But really at this stage with silver now finding a new elevated level, it's, the hedge is just too low. Uh, for us to lean on uh, with short-term weekly rights. And so we needed to ra raise that strike. If you even want to go to the 23 strike and pay up a little bit, you can. And the other thing is I wanted to just add a little bit more time so we can uh, spend more time income harvesting on this for another month. And so we're, we're going to be, uh, we're basically closing the old October $20 strike. And now we're going to have a new position with the November 22 and we're going to sell at the 24 or 25 strikes. Now, I want to show some people some interesting ways of approaching this that you can stylize this. Now, I'm publishing it officially, and I'm going to track it officially the way I just published it. Uh, but those of you that want to stylize this can do so. And so let me show you some different ways to approach this. Uh, what, I, what you can do is, for instance, we're gonna, we now are going to own, let's say, these 10 of these November 22s. And officially, we're selling these uh, September 18th, $24 puts, which are 18 cents on the bid. So you, for 10 days or nine days, we're gonna go and snag ourselves a, a quick income premium uh, for, for this uh, income harvest. But, Notice the $25 strike is paying 46 cents. Now that's a nice juicy premium, but uh, that is really tight at the money. I mean, unless you genuinely believe that silver is about to have a face ripping rally and it's beginning right now, then you should be snagging that 46 cent premium. But one of the things that you could do is stagger your income rights. So you could do something like sell two or three of these up here at 46 and then sell another eight down here at 40, uh, uh, sorry, um, for the 46 cent premium, and then you could sell another eight at 24, right? You could stagger your, your selling so you can enhance your income, but at the same time, you're only taking risk on two contracts. You're just basically giving yourself a little extra juice on this, uh, a part of the risk. And that way you can manage down a roll down very easily if you start running into trouble, but yet you're enhancing the amount of income you're earning on there. Anyway, that's just an example of what you can do. I tend to do things, little tactical strategies like that personally. I just am not going to publish and manage it that way. The official trade that we're tracking for all of you is this. Uh, we're out to November at the 22 and we're snagging uh, that premium on that September 18th, 24 put income right. And so we're uh, back to income writing on silver and that's in there. The other thing that I wanted to touch on is uh, our, uh, what continues to be a very successful income uh, operation on right, selling income on this GDX. And so now ignore the thousand shares, that thousand shares belongs to another strategy. What we have is this $35 call and we continue to sell out of the money short-term income rights. Uh, um, uh, and in this case, we had the September $50 strike uh, uh, sold against this. Now, the, um, uh, and Ben, absolutely, you can start the SLV as a new position. Uh, it, it's uh, just as valid as when we started it. Uh, the GDX in this situation, this $50 call is just bid zero, one cent ask. It already has realized the entire $1,400 income right we snagged it for, right? It was a great income right. We made a nice, big, juicy income, uh, and it, but it's already banked. 
the point I want to make is that the balancing act is this. Do we just turn around and begin selling a new, let's say, October income right today? Or do we just be patient? Because in the next week, if the GDX uh, bull breaks out, we're going to be able to sell at a much higher income, uh, a higher strike price because gold has uh, broken out. If, go if the GDX was not setting up in such a be uh, beautiful bull flag pattern, I would already be selling the new income right. But I think at this moment, we might as well first discover whether this is breaking out or not. If it isn't, and GDX kind of comes right back down to 40 and it's stuck in the mud, we can turn around and, and, and slam a new October income right in the 48 to $50 uh, um, uh, strike prices and harvest another income grab. Uh, I'm totally for it. But if we, for whatever reason, suddenly find ourselves in the next few days with a quick impulse to 46 on the upside, suddenly that $50 strike, we might be able to snag another buck or two for another income uh, month of income writing, and that would be a gift. And so let, I, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. I would, have done, I would have published it today if I wanted all, uh, members to act. Let's see. If we're gifted with a quick impulse up to 45, 46, we'll jump on it and immediately snag a brand new income right at the higher strike. Uh, um, now, those of you that are doing this in uh, an account that will not let you carry this 50 call uh, strike naked, it, if you're willing to pay the commission and the one cent to close this out, so you're unconstrained that if we were to get an impulse, you can act without having to deal with uh, covering that uh, option later, you could, uh, you know, for me, because I can carry a naked, I, I feel pretty confident in saying that the, that option in a, in a week's time is, uh, is almost certain to expire. And so for me to spend the, com the commission and, and the one cent to, uh, to close it is not worth it uh, because I can turn around and sell an income right against it very easily uh, but those of you that can't carry a naked, you'll have to make that decision on your own if, if, you, if you have to. The, um, other, than that, uh, other, other than that, what else is there on the income? Nah, that's about it. I mean, uh, those of you that prefer Exxon Mobil over Suncor, I just want to point out like, okay, so I sold it on Suncor, but if you prefer Exxon Mobil, which I, I love and I have no issues whatsoever. Uh, if you go out and snag a one year 2022 on Exxon, notice even that 2250 or the uh, uh, strike, you could probably snag a buck and a quarter to, uh, to a buck 50 on uh, a 2250. Even the 20 strike, you'll snag a buck. Uh, selling that one to me is a no brainer. Right, and so if you, uh, I'm publishing and tracking Suncor in the in the account. If you have a personal preference of Exxon Mobil, uh, I can't say you're making a mistake. I think that both of them are just uh, there to me. That I wouldn't do both of them. I would choose one or the other. And if you have a personal preference, I think that both of them are in the same macro theme and are are both either going to work or both going to be assigned to us. Uh, and so I think that you, it's, yeah, CVX is the same thing, all right? Like Chevron, uh, the thing is the Chevron is much farther from its $50 low when it's up here at 80. And so the only thing there, Paul, that I would say about this one is, is that you're, you're a little bit uh, farther from that on that front. Um, yeah, Anthony, of course, there's an... All the energy stocks are at dividend cut risk. There's, that is... That is uh, very well advertised news. I actually would argue that much of that has already been uh, baked into the cake, right? And so, uh, I mean, uh, I in fact think that a dividend cut on uh, Exxon would actually be a, a sell the rumor, buy the news event. It, it's, I think it's, it's not a, it's the most obvious risk that everyone is already accounting for on that front. The, um, in terms of at and it's, uh, it's amazing how AT&T has been stuck in the sideways range. And those of you that have been 
running your income operation on AT&T. It's been, uh, even though volatility has narrowed and so the, the weekly premiums were, have been much thinner than they were when we were in the high vol condition period, I still think AT&T is very reasonable. The only problem I have with this chart is a stock that could not rally during the bull phase. That is, feels like it's rolling over. I can't help but to think that if the market goes through a, uh, another round of shellacking to the downside, that, that, sh that, uh, that AT&T becomes vulnerable for a, a downdraft at 27 or 20, uh, 28. If you are wanting to continue the income operation on AT&T, my suggestion to you is that you uh, mismatch the quantity of your position. So let me give an example. Uh, I'm not going to publish AT&T, so let's actually just treat AT&T as a brand new position. So let's just say right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do at the money income rights against a December hedge. And so what I might do is say I'm going to snag a, uh, let's just say a $27 strike out to December for 82 cents or 84 cents, right? And so let's say I'm going to sell 10 of these. Buy, sorry, buy 10 of these as my anchor hedge. And I'm going to start selling some at the money income premiums on, um, on AT&T. And so I'm going to, let's say, begin my operation by selling uh, the September 18th, $29 right? Which is paying 26 cents, which means in just one, uh, uh, one plus weeks, I can uh, dent uh, almost um, uh, one third of the value of our, my longer term hedge by doing this right. Now, the tactical thing that I would be doing on this is I would be, when I sell this, I'll mismatch my income right. So I might sell only seven income rights at 26 cents. So I'm overhedged. Now, what's the rationale behind this? Well, the rationale behind it is if the stock market's at risk of getting clobbered and AT&T might actually downdraft from 29 down to 28 or down to 27, you now have two, ex two or three extra puts uh, that are going to give you the additional hedge of you being overhedged, but it actually allows you then to reposition your entire income right uh, for uh, a repositioning down to the 28 or 27 strike, a higher vol when you roll it down by being able to sell three additional ones when you make the adjusting trade. And so one of the ways that I would tactically treat this is, is that if you're going to do something like an AT&T for an income writing operation, uh, then I would basically uh, uh, turn around and... Um, and mismatch and almost be overhedged, right, Dominic? Uh, and so, so it's up to you if you want to do that, but, uh, but that's at least one way that I'd approach it. Uh, so, Paul, uh, just as AT&T straddle, you know, the problem I have is suddenly AT&T is uh, starting to, to trade with, you know, 25 vol premiums on the upside for a stock that hasn't moved. Um, I find that much harder to justify straddling than, than stocks. I don't think that the implied volatilities are uh, mispriced that a straddle will pay off. Uh, I, I feel that generally, um, unless you believe that a downside break on AT&T is going to send this thing to 22 bucks, which is not my base case, but you, if you believe that move by the end of the year that AT&T is capable of that kind of a downdraft, then straddling AT&T is a no-brainer. But I, my intuition is that this stock is so boring and so pin that it, if the whole market gets uh, clobbered, all AT&T may do is a double bottom retest and a quick trip down to 27 before it bounces back to 28, 29 on the reaction. And so it's not an exciting trade for me. Um, on on that front, uh, an iron condor tool on it, yeah, you could do that. I mean, if you, I, I could see the merit of that. I I, I think that on balance, AT and T is much more likely to 
to be less volatile. There's, this is not where the selling pressure would, uh, I think, ma manifest itself if the market started to really downdraft. And so because of that, I think that, uh, that this, this is not the candidate for a straddle, in my opinion. Anyway, so, so Chris, uh, natural gas. Oh, so what, Chris, what I would have, what you have to focus on in that gas is two things. Number one, what contract do you want to trade your Nat gas story on, or are you first of all trading UNG? So now UNG is rolling front months and you're getting the pullback. Now you have to accept the fact that this thing will massively underperform the roll up of the uh, continuous contract. I think the continuous contract might very well roll up 30% on the upside of Nat gas. And this thing will uh, maybe at best retail, rest, retest 14 or 15, unless the entire term structure rises on Nat gas. Uh, and uh, as there's a structural fundamental shift in natural gas futures. Uh, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, test driving a couple of people that I think might be interesting guests for the market huddle that are not gas traders that might be interesting to kind of get their take on what they think is going to happen. But the point I want to make is take something like a longer term contract, right? So let's just say you're going to go out to the uh, even December 2021 and go a year out. You can see here that nat gas futures farther out on the curve uh, are all uh, are trading at a completely different pattern than what we're seeing here in these front months uh, um, and so you have a you have a scenario where uh, where this longer term 2021 contract has just finished its measured move and we haven't at this part of the term structure even seen the beginning of a pullback or correction on that gas. This is the, the tricky part of trying to figure out what's next for the, uh, for the trade, right? Because we continue to see a scenario where natural gas, all we're really going to see is, uh, is it rolling up the term structure. So I'm just going to pull it up again just to, to make it clear. The, the, the term structure currently continues to price in uh, an advance from its current $2.30 price to that by the time we're trading in the December contract, the NAT gas is going to be trading at $3.31, like a dollar higher than where we're trading. That's being priced out just two, three months out. Right, and so uh, so in my mind, um, you can't profit from this. This has already been baked into the term structure. This is already priced in. So when that UNG is rolling their front month out, they're just going to kill the UNG participants with uh, with the contango roll up. It's just going to be one monstrous tax on that ETF. And there's and you can't go out and buy a contract anticipating the profit of that. That's already been made. I don't know. I just think that uh, the easiest thing for us to do is wait for the turn. This is um, the, the range resources. I think as soon as the buy on dip happens, this uh, entire correction on this stock will offer a, um, a brand new breakout. And that's going to keep it simple. You don't have to, to, to um, uh, play the Widowmaker future contract that, that uh, you can instead turn around and, uh, and play the fact that this will be a net benefactor of this. I think that uh, sticking to like a NAT gas stock like Range Resources has been behaving far better than some of the other NAT gas stocks, I think is the, um, a very good way to approach this. Anyway, so um, that's uh, what I wanted to cover. Let's quickly just review uh, what's going on in some of these, um, uh, some of our plays. You can see here, uh, the home builders uh, the, uh, got a little bit of a pop uh, working initially up, but nowhere near our target one at 56 just yet. Those of you that, if, you, if those of you, if you see the S&P 500, 
uh, move to 3450, 3480, the FIB zones above. And you're trading a 5550 on this. You should already preemptively roll up as a target one hit uh, just because of where the S&P is. It what would, uh, I think one of the most disappointing things that could happen that I want members to be thinking about and planning for, let me just break this to a one hour chart. What would be disappointing for me is that if we saw this trade to 55.50 and you, you grabbed a couple points on the upside in two days off of this breakout and we didn't lock it in and then the market starts getting kiboshed and this thing turns without a direct tap into 56. The way I'm, so what I'm just saying is if this thing snags you 50 to 80 cents more on the upside while the S&P is making that move, don't wait for the perfect $56 hit for you to take a defensive action on the home builders. It's better we take the first defensive move early and just because of where we are in the market conditions. Uh, Micron, still like it. Uh, I still, I mean, is there one more zigzag where Micron might impulse higher before it heads lower? It doesn't matter. I want to be short Micron. Yamana Gold, this is the same chart as the GDX. Either they're all going to go or they're not going to go. I still like the regional banks short. Hasn't really engaged. Still as good as when we published it. I think you can be shorting this here. We're, if uh, Valero, We'll see Valero is getting hammered right now. We'll see whether or not uh, this, uh, this musters up a save. The problem I have with Valero is like, like Suncor or any of the other energy plays, they're beating their FIB zones, which means that the selling is not fully played out yet. So it looks like Sun, uh, Valero and all of these um, energy names are going for some major bottom retest on the downside, which I think is going to be an amazing buying opportunity but it is going to be a retest. So we'll see. Uh, Raytheon this morning, once again, tried to rally. Uh, it's up a dollar, but uh, can this thing make it stick? I would love to see it hold one of these rallies up above 62 by Friday. I mean, it would make me feel better about keeping it on active on our list. Right. And for, uh, so, I mean, we are on the hedge. We are out to the September 18th. So we are not going to officially drop it this Friday because uh, if we got the 61 hedge in there and we already paid for it, uh, I don't, it to me, it doesn't hurt us discovering whether or not uh, this um, turns on the upside from here or not. Uh, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how it plays out. Other than that, very quickly, just circling back to Newmont and Pan American, we drop them. But I have every intention of publishing more gold breakouts if this is going to stick. And the jury's out in the next 24 hours to find out whether or not uh, we're going to get this uh, turning back up. But if Newmont and Pan American are, are rolling up, we'll see all the gold miners roll up. And, I, and I'm going to want to, um, uh, and I'm going to want to be in there. So the... Um, other than that, uh, I what else is there? Yeah, just I, I'm gonna. I also want to publish range resources again if it uh, breaks out on that upside. So we'll see. I wanted to uh, just touch on Walmart and Costco. I wanted to point out that both Walmart and Costco remain at a very interesting buy zone. Uh, will if if for whatever reason if this pullback was all we're gonna see, and the market turns bullish from here. This is going to end up proving to being a buy and dip on all of these pullbacks. And so it's, I haven't bought any Walmart position back since, we, uh, since I exited the position. But this is a, I pushed this a little higher on my list. I want to watch to see whether this thing can stick on the breakout. And, um, and so anyway, that's uh, certainly something I think is going to be really interesting. And that's no different than Costco on this pullback. All uh, right, Costco's entire um, pullback, three-day pullback, basically came to the 61.8 retrace and is already trying to turn up. Will we see, uh, uh, will we see this uh, play out? We'll see. Yeah, Herman, you're saying Walmart's low. If, if, uh, if TikTok doesn't happen, that would certainly derail that Walmart move, right? Uh, so we'll see. Um, What else is there? Mm 
yeah anyway the uh I'm, I'm just seeing if there's any questions i missed here now anyway so listen uh i i will uh oh, let's talk sting sure so so far So far, the entire pullback has held above the FIB zone. And this morning, the one-hour chart on, on Sting has given uh, it a, a breakout attempt. Will we see um, the next impulse on Sting sending this thing to 14, 14 and a half? That's actually a very high interest level for me on Sting. Because if you look on the daily chart, all of these highs lie right along this 14 handle. And the way I kind of look at it is that a, um, a sting stock, uh, if Scorpio can't beat 14, it's still in the, gonna be in the process of bottoming. Maybe it'll prove to be a major uh, inverted head and shoulders pattern. Uh, it'll be a very long basing pattern. But the way I would put it, is, uh, is that uh, any breakout on the upside of uh, sting above 14 is where the real window opens for the upside. And so I just want to curb everyone's enthusiasm. It's the first positive price action we've seen in a while, but I also don't want to get super excited. There is a very uh, large amount of traders. Uh, like, let me put on a volume profile here on this. I want to just point out, there's a very large amount of traders that have, there's two accumulation points. There's huge amount of volume that transacted down here, but there is a very large amount of volume that transacted in this range right in here. And the way I look at it is that any, any stock that is structurally been beaten this bad has a whole wave of traders that are really pissed off they're losing money in the stock. And the moment the stock rallies and everyone sees that they can get out close to break even, suddenly there's an impulse of brand new selling pressure that comes in of a whole wave of traders that felt trapped in the position. It takes a while for a stock that's been beaten this badly in order to establish a, uh, a solid base to transfer the shares from now what are the weak hands that need to get out to what will ultimately be the longer term base that will be the foundation of another bull advance in the stock. It probably will take the rest of the year for Sting at minimum to establish uh, the base from which uh, it can start a new bull phase. Uh, I, I, I just want everyone to curb their enthusiasm. There probably isn't much more downside risk, I think, on Sting, but anyone who thinks that there's some miracle rally to 20 to 25 coming imminently is probably going to be disappointed. Uh, I think that this stock is going to, every time it tries to rally, is going to get hammered and it's going to be stuck in a very, uh, yeah, it's going to, it's going to be called the cuppy Kool-Aid hangover mark. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Uh, and, but it, it's, and it's going to be a longer hangover than most. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the uh, the point though is 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 that there, if uh, I really do believe that this is a very respectable stock, and I don't think it's going bankrupt or anything like that, and so it's going to establish a base. If these end up proving to be where the major lows are, then it's a very asymmetric level to uh, to own it. But I uh, I want to remind everyone, it may feel on Scorpio a lot like waiting for on a weekly chart here uh, for gold miners to turn after this uh, consolidation, which took basically a year and a half. Uh, it takes a long time for things to transition from being bearish to bullish often when something is that much structural selling and technical damage. And so it's probably dead money for a while, but it's also probably got not much downside risk from these levels. And so you take that for what it is. It probably will prove to be a very good options for income stock, right? And, and so to me, turning around and selling that income premium 
on Scorpio may prove to being the best uh, thing to do for the next year is just to harvest premium. And every time the thing sells, you have it put to you, right? Like uh, right now, as an example, right, the options for income are, uh, we were selling the 10 and $8 puts for the rest of the year. Those things are still paying, uh, you know, for you taking on the obligation of having Scorpio put to you at $10 or eight bucks, it's still paying you a buck 10 and 50 cents, right? That's, you know, snagging a buck 10 at 10 means that for the rest of the year, you're going to snag a 10% premium uh, on, uh, on Scorpio for buying it 30% lower than where it's trading. And if it's put to you, your average cost is nine bucks, right? To me, I think that strategy of selling premium on the stock is going to be the way to, to chip away at this thing. That's, uh, that's just my food for thought. I, that'll work better than hoping uh, that there's going to be a big bull phase in that stock in the interim. Uh, RCL, look, um, shit, there we go. Uh, so these, uh, these cruise liners, um, I, I don't, I mean, look, this measured move on the upside toward 80 and 90 can happen. Uh, do I think that this is a time to still be buying these things? I don't know. I'm, I mean, I wish I had a strong conviction on this. I, I have nothing really I can uh, say on this. Um, Activision, this is going to sell with the whole market. Like this could prove to be a buy on dip. If you believe that the selling in the broad market is done, then this zigzag down into the fib zone may prove to being um, the buy on dip on a stock like Activision. But if the whole stock market's about to get shellacked on another round of selling pre-elections, the vulnerability remains that uh, the, the rips get faded and this thing still has one more round of selling downwards on this, uh, Kevin. So uh, I, I love the stock. I think uh, the opportunity to buy this stock on dips will be there. But uh, really at this stage, it, it comes down to just watching. It's correlation to the NASDAQ is going to be there, I think. You're just going to have to accept that, that we had a great run that benefited from the whole you know, COVID story. Everyone staying at home and gaming, right? Like here's the, the FIB retrace on Electronic Arts or um, on um, – uh, Take Two Interactive, all of the software companies getting hammered on uh, on this initial break. Is it all over on there? I don't know. It, I think they're still vulnerable for more rounds of selling. The, uh, I'm gonna. By the way, I'll, I'll finish off with uh, a quick look at the S and P here. But Amgen, disappointing that it gave back the initial rally. I still like the company a lot, but let's be realistic. Uh, if the whole stock market's getting hammered, I wonder what will be safe. I asked that openly as a thing. I, will, will the biotechs be able to kind of march to the beat of our own drum? It does, initially, it doesn't look like it. Uh, and so let's watch and see. I, 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 liked, I liked the idea of them rallying, but when the market turned here, this bearish engulfing candle turning off the previous highs is making the trade suspect now. The um, TLT, this is, uh, I still think this is a buying opportunity down long here. But what is interesting is these treasury bonds are not getting excited about the current market correction. Uh, and uh, will that, is that just a lag effect? I've had now numerous people tell me that they don't believe that the treasury bonds will rally during the next market sell-off. I thought that is an interesting idea. I mean, do I feel that, uh, what, what's my conviction on that? I don't like it. I, I, I think that bonds will rally. I think that uh, any, the, I feel that bonds will do what bonds do best, which is that they'll be a risk-off asset. And I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't think that that will change imminently. Anyway, the initial move on the S&P was uh, a bump along here. Now, what I, if this one hour chart turns back up, uh, especially right off this level around 3,400, then, then it's still going up. What, you, what all of you should be watching here is if by the end of the, um, uh, if by the end of the day, 
S and uh, not in the day, by even this afternoon, these are one hour charts. If we're already giving back the breakout attempt, uh, then that's showing you that all rallies are being sold and that immediately should be um, putting all of you on, on um, alert that the S&P might be doing that role. And so, so watch it closely. It's gonna be, um, uh, it's gonna be really interesting to see uh, how this continues to play out. Um, Oh, Sergio, for sure. G uh, Gunlack was saying that high yield bonds are the most overvalued in history. Absolutely, absolutely. And I have absolutely no problem uh, carrying a, uh, uh, our position on, uh, on the um, small caps with the debit spread. Anyway, thanks everyone for joining me. Uh, 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 Dimitri, we are not moving on that 335 call. Uh, until we, uh, it, at this stage, it's the way that we're securing the intrinsic value between 355 and 335. Consider it a tax on being long-term bearish. And, uh, and so we're, we're not moving on that. Um, uh, and so that's, that's our little uh, play. Anyway, thanks everyone for joining me. Have a good trading day. Uh, I'll give all of you an update tomorrow. Thanks everyone.